You're the resurrection that we waited for. You buried the night and came with the morning. You're the King of Heaven. The praise is yours. The longer the quiet, the louder the chorus soars. You're the living water, God. We thirst for you. The dry and the barren will flower and bloom. You're the sun that's shining. You restore my soul. The deeper you call us, oh, the deeper we'll go. We will sing a new song. Towards the light, your love is like springtime. Come tend the soil, come tend the soil of my soul, and like a garden. And like a garden, I will grow. Come tend the soil, come tend the soil of my soul. And like a garden, and like a garden, I will grow. Good morning and welcome to our Living Word Home Church service. I hope you're doing well. I'm Pastor Benny and if you're joining us for the first time, thank you for being a part of this time with us as we learn and grow in God's Word together. Amen? Well, God is good, folks. If you're like me and you got to enjoy this extra hour of sleep, it was amazing. Well, we've been doing a series on Why God Why. And uh, if you've been following us, I'm sure you've been blessed. If not, you can catch us up on livingword.nyc or join us on YouTube. Amen? But today's theme is, can I really trust God? Should I? Or why should I? Let's bow our heads and pray before we get started. Father, we just thank you. Father, we thank you for your word, which you promised will not be returned void. We ask you to search our heart, our mind, our soul, our spirit. We ask you to give us your revelation of your truth this day. And for this victory, in Jesus' name, and all the saints said, amen and amen. Well, folks, can I really trust God? Should I? 
or why should I? You know, last week I talked about uh, when we doubt God. Today we're going to talk about, you know, the opposite of this thing. Can I really trust God? You know, why should I? When we are constantly struggling, trying to make sense of all the things that are going on around us, right? You know, the violence, the war in Europe, in Europe, the war in Israel, the war in Ukraine, the war, you know, the bills that we're trying to, you know, pay, fighting with temptation, addictions, just trying to keep the marriage and the children in check, trying to keep from drowning and fighting the discouragement, the depression, or just trying to keep from losing it. You there? You've been there? You know, it seems like we're fighting a never-ending battle. One battle after another, right? And we're saying, where are you in all this? Can I really trust you, God, with all that's going on? Yeah? You know, like I said last week, it was e I said it's easy to doubt when we're facing impossible situations. You know, a lot of the things we are seeing today, uh, you know, makes us wonder. Makes, why? Why, God? But I want you to turn your Bibles right now to the book of Psalm, chapter 20, verse 7, NIV version. Listen to what David is saying here. He says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. What a powerful statement by David. And to be honest, this is one of my favorite scripture verses as well. The fact that there are a great many things that we can lose in life, folks. Anything can be taken away. That's right, folks. Material possessions, a job, even a family member. And when that happens, it can cause us. It can cause us to think whether or not we can trust God. In this scripture, uh, the book of uh, Psalms chapter 20, David is saying that when we trust God, we have permanence and stability. That's right. He's saying that we, we cannot be shaken from God's favor. That's what he's saying, folks. When he's our foundation, I'm talking about when he's our rock, he'll never leave us, never forsake us, never abandon us, or fail us ever, folks, when he's our foundation. This should be what I call a anchor scripture. You ever heard of that? Something you that holds you, you know, that when you're going through something or preparing for a battle, this scripture, this anchor scripture holds us steady. When we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, folks, we need anchor scriptures to keep us, again, from lose, being distracted. You know, I, I don't know if you remember, but I memorized my first scripture verse, you know, that became my anchor scripture for years. It was 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Give thanks in all circumstances, for it is God's will for you, for me, in Christ Jesus. Boy, did I hold on to that. This scripture verse in the book of Psalm, the scripture points out, out not to trust in chariots and horses. It refers not to put, uh, it says, it refers to not putting your trust in what you can see or feel. That's right. Instead, putting your trust in what you cannot see and what can't be seen. You know, back then where when the, we went into a battle, you know, it was a great advantage to have a war horse. You see? You know, it was like having an arsenal. It was like having firepower, a tank. Today, any physical, financial, whether it's financial, intellectual advantage, that can be considered power, control, and even success. Looking for a physical solution for our problems has become a way of life for us today. That's right. Looking for what's tangible has become easy to believe. So, can I really trust God if I can't see him? You know, I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, the NIV version. He says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and an assurance about what we do not see. That's faith, folks. 
Now, when we go back to David, David understood that the true might, that true might, true power and strength of his nation was not in weapons, but in worship and in God's word. That is power. You see, that's what it's all about. It, it, the scripture was saying that some can trust in money, right? A lot of people trust in how much money they have in the bank. Well, they can even trust in experience, knowledge, right? Degrees or, uh, or the level of success that they have, right? All good things. You know, I'm not saying but they're all good things, of course, but it, it's limited. Or should I say it's only, it only has a limited ability to control. What? What does that mean? A limited ability to control? Well, it can be taken away. Like I just said, it doesn't last. You know, what's impressed, what impressed me about David and the most uh, was his faith after his doubt. That's what impressed me more about David. Like we talked about last week with Doubting Thomas, right? Listen to David's prior statements, prior to this chapter 20 uh, of the book of Psalms. And I went, in chapter 13, David is praying for relief from his despair, right? I want you to turn your Bibles right into the book of Psalms, chapter 13, verse 1 to 2, the NIV version. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemies triumph over me? This is David. What is he saying? Where are you when I need you? See, folks, sometimes we have to continue to trust God even when he doesn't answer us immediately. God's timing isn't our timing. We can trust God, folks. That's a fact. Sometimes we all, all we need is to talk. Talk about the problem to someone or with someone, a friend, a brother, a sister. Go to the Lord like Thomas did when he went to his fellow disciples and when he went to Jesus. He shared his concerns. It helps to put, a, to put things in perspective when we can share. I can tell you how many times sharing and hearing someone else's perspective have blessed me. It set me free. Folks, don't let pride rob you of your freedom. That's right. Don't let pride rob you of your freedom to grow. Do something about it. Don't just wait for it to come and fall into your lap. Pray, study, fellowship. Folks, if you need to come and join us in our prayer meetings on Tuesday night, serve even. That, those, these are the things that God has prepared, has given us to, to be able to experience Him in a new way. You know, early in my Christian walk, I was working for a company called Baca a famous crystal company. I was a, a manager of one of their departments. Uh, and, and one day, you know, they decided to consolidate all the departments. And, uh, you know, they had quite a few departments. So they were putting all these departments uh, just to become one. But this meant that my position was no longer required. This one guy from another department, which I knew, he was always looking for an opportunity to bring it up. You know, the fact that I was losing my position. He would ask me uh, where, where I was going or what was I going to do now. And, and it took it, I took it as if he was trying to mock me. Implying that I was uh, going to, you know, lose my job. You know, that they were going to let me go. He would say, oh, what are you going to do now? He would say, and he kept saying these things every time he ran into me, you know. And it started to keep, I kept repeating this in my head, overthinking, assuming maybe, I, maybe I'm going to lose my, my job. You know, I'm, if I'm losing my position, right? 
Now, during this time, I was, I was really on fire for God. I was excited about God. I was doing God's work. You know, this, this same guy's colleagues and the guys from his department would come to me, you know, when they needed something, you know. And I remember, you know, looking back, I remember counseling these guys. We had a small little cafeteria, and I remember, you know, ministering to these people, uh, you know. And looking back, I didn't even realize that I was being used by God to minister at this job. Although God was using me, those thoughts... You know, those thoughts, boy, just all about what, what this guy said to me just kept, you kept, I kept repeating, it kept getting bigger and bigger in my head. I felt as if uh, someone was trying to rob me of my joy. It was frustrating. It started to bother me, literally. It was feeling, I was feeling like, it was like feeling doubt. And I was a bit embarrassed to my, I was truly embarrassed. But I knew that I had to talk to someone. So when uh, so I went to see uh, the associate pastor at the time. And I told him what was going on. And let me tell you, he wasn't a kind of, he wasn't a gentle type of guy. You know, he just said, uh, you know who you are. Pray about it. That's it. I said, what? That's it? I felt like he, you know, when you take the band-aid off a wound, but well, this was like taking a duct tape off a wound. But it worked. It was all I needed. It was all I needed to hear. And so I prayed, and it helped me to get my perspective right. My peace. My peace of mind. See, sometimes we just, you know, we can't, we, we, we can be impatient, wanting it now. When the truth is, God's always on time. He's never late. You know, so David frequently claimed, you know, when I think about it, he frequently claimed that God was too slow to act on his behalf. You read some of these Psalms. And as we do when we are going through our own stuff, right? Or when we see injustice, we wonder, where are you, God? David affirmed that he would continue to trust God no matter how long he had to wait. For me, it turned out that I lost my title. But you know what? They gave me more money and less responsibility. I was okay with that. I was content. It turned out that I did get fired and they didn't want, and, uh, they didn't want me to leave. I can't tell you the look on that guy's face. <laughs> but I tell you this, less than a month later, I was offered a position to be a youth pastor here at Living Word. God's timing, folks. See? We can trust God even when we don't see Him. How do we grow to trust God when we can't see Him? Right? When we can't see? Well, here it is. There are three things. We question, we pray, we surrender. That's it. Those are the three things we do. Can we actually question God? Absolutely. Yes, without a doubt. See, we see David, which the Bible said was a man after God's own heart. He questioned God all the time. So how do we grow to trust God when we can't see Someone once said, we're closer to God when we are asking questions than when we think we hold all the answers. You remember the story of the man who took his son to the disciples, to the disciples and, and then to Jesus because the disciples couldn't get the job done. You know, his son was being tormented by evil spirit. See, trying to kill him. And listen to what the father is, as he's talking to Jesus in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 22, the NLT version. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. This he's, he's talking to Jesus here, if you can. 
And if you look at Jesus' response in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, the NLT version, what do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. Now, I love this story. Now, here lies the problem. Jesus didn't say we automatically attain obtain anything we want just by claiming it or by thinking positively. He meant that anything is possible if we believe. Because nothing is too difficult for God. You've got to understand that concept. We are not going to get everything we pray for as if by magic, folks. But with faith, we can have everything we need to serve God. I hope we got that right. We're going to have a discussion and a Q&A about this. So if you can join us right after the service. Folks, faith is a gift from God. It comes with a purpose. Now there are two things that you have to consider and understand to describe faith. Based on Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. That is that it is sure and that it is certain. That's right. Now, these two qualities is, is almost like saying it's the beginning and the ending point. The beginning point of faith is believing in God's character. That's number one. He is who he say he is. And the ending point is believing in God's promises. He will do what he says. End the story. When we believe that God will fulfill his promises, even though we don't see those promises materializing yet, we demonstrate true faith. Folks, here's the thing. The attitude of trust and confidence that uh, the Bible calls belief or faith is not something we can obtain without help. Okay, what? You might be saying. Because no matter how much faith we have, we never reach the point of being self-sufficient. That's right. We cannot store faith like money in the bank. Growing faith is a constant process of daily renewing our minds and our trust and trust in Jesus. That's right. It has to be constantly being developed. So what did the dad do when he asked the question? You see, now, now we're going to put this in perspective. Now here's an ouch moment before I continue. God would rather you run to him with your questions than run from him with your doubts. That's what this man, dad, did. He ran to Jesus with his question. And then, the second thing, he prayed. That's right, folks. He went seeking Jesus. And when he went to see Jesus, he found him. The Bible says, seek and you will find. Now, I want you to turn the book to the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 23, 24, the NIV version. If you can, said Jesus, he said, everything is possible for one who believes. He says, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. That was his prayer. And although the father was struggling, he asked the question. And then he prayed that Jesus would help him with his faith. And that's what we need to be doing, folks. He was humble, not afraid to expose his doubt, and Jesus responded with compassion. Help me overcome my unbelief, he said. He may not have had faith in himself, but he did have it in Jesus. The father wasn't the only one struggling with doubt in the story, folks, if you read it. Jesus didn't dismiss him 
or tell him to come back when he got some faith. He heard him out. He cast out the demon. And he built the dad's faith. That's right. So what do we do when we find it difficult to trust God? When we can't see any possible solution? Imagine. Imagine when we do see. When we see God do what he does. What would happen? So the third thing that we have to consider is, is to surrender. So we question, we pray, and then we surrender. As we grow in our faith, folks, we choose to trust God, even when we don't understand. That's how we surrender. How often do we hear, let go and let God? I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, the NIV version. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. He said, submit to him. But I love the easy reversion. Listen to the easy reversion. He says, trust in the Lord completely. Do not think that you understand things well enough for yourself. Whatever you are doing, then he will show you the right way to go. What would you say is the problem with understanding? Our understanding? See? Folks, it is that it's limited. Have we ever had something, have we ever done something stupid? I mean, everybody should be raising their hands, right? But at first you thought, you might have thought it was a good idea. Right? God says, don't lean on what's limited. That's right. He says to trust him even though it doesn't make sense. Because truthfully, he can't fail us. And here's another ouch moment. Trusting God doesn't mean you always get what you want. Ouch. That's really an ouch, right? Trust in the Greek would say it's having confidence, the assurance that leads to action. But trust in the Lord is a faith that lets us boldly serve. Now, I don't usually use the Hebrew translations, and I don't want anyone to botch this name up, but the Hebrew word for the trust is uh, batach. Forgive me if I tore that up. It means stretch out. To lie face down before God. It represents a, a servant wanting or waiting for the master's will or command. That's what, that's what it is. That's what it translates. It says when you trust, you are surrendered to the will or command of the master. I love that interpretation because that's exactly what it is. It's like when Jesus was face down in the Garden of Gethsemane before going to the cross, totally surrendered to the Father's will. When he, would, when he said, Lord, not my will, but yours, no one looks forward to being on the cross. So what does it mean to trust God with all your heart in a practical sense? Remember, we have to understand this first. It's not always getting what we want. You know, I remember working with teens. I mean, I don't know. This just thought just came into mind. And I figured, let me just say it because it might be relevant to this case. You know, I used to do activities with teenagers way back in the day. And they had prizes. I would have them win prizes. And, and cash was one of the prizes. But the, okay, everything came with a condition. You understand? It had a purpose. You know, so one kid one time won $20. In, in his, you know, but the condition was to use the $20 to, you know, again, use it for some good, you know, put it to good use, do something good with it, help someone with it. You know that he turned it, he gave it back because he didn't want the responsibility? Because we don't get what we want and to use it the way we want it, then it's not worth it. Folks, trusting God means that no matter what happens, you believe that God loves you and is working 
all things out for your good. So whether you think it's going to benefit you or not, it will. It is good for you because God's plan is to to do so. It might not be what you expect, but it will definitely be far better than you can imagine. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 8, 28, the NIV version. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Sometimes we're so used to the dysfunction that we're looking our reward. We're looking for a dysfunctional reward. and don't see the good in what God says is good for you. When we compare David to the boy's father and Jesus, you find that they each had questions, prayer, and surrender. They questioned. They prayed. And they surrendered. Right? David, where where are you, Lord? David said, right? One thing I asked, Surrender, but we trust in the name of the Lord. That's where you surrender, right? When you pray, one thing I ask. When you surrender, but we trust in the name of the Lord. That was David. When we look at the dad, he questioned, if you can. He prayed, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. And he surrendered, right? He trusted. So often, folks, we may not see it because we don't get it the way we want it. You might be in a place right now, struggling, hurting, having questions, wanting to know how do I trust God? with all this that's going on. And I want to pray with you right now. Maybe you're trying to save your your relationships or, or you're trying to do things in your own strength. Maybe you want to get married and you don't see any prospects out there. Whatever it is, we want to be able to pray with you right now as we question, as we pray, and as we surrender. Let's just bow our heads right now. Father, we thank you for your word which you promise will not be returned void. So we're promising, we're holding on to your promise, Lord, that you will just answer us this day, that you will give us the blessings that we're looking for as we seek you, Lord. As you change that Father's heart, Lord, we ask you to change our heart, change our eyes, to be able to see things through your eyes and not our own. Thank you for the victory we have in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Folks, we are having our Q&A following this message. So if you can join us, we would love to have you. Uh, you can join us on, on, so you can find livingword.nyc or find it as you find it as you close this message. Uh, we're going to say, as I say every week, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. One final state. We just started our new membership class. Please join us. If you need information, contact us on livingwork.nyc. God bless you and take care. Take care.